My name is Natasha and I am 40. Hi, I'm Katie. I am 42. I'm Carrie. I'm 46 years old. I'm Lizzie. I'm 38. Jane Regan Payne, 55 years old. Welcome back to Interwoven's fourth season, featuring conversations centered on life's essentials and on celebrating and supporting women in middle life. We are thrilled this season to exchange support with Melnick & Melnick SC. Melnick & Melnick SC is a law firm of women dedicated to supporting small business owners. They manage legal issues with collaborative solutions, cost-effective strategies, and up-to-date communications. Melnick & Melnick SC values women and entrepreneurs so much that in 2017, they started She Stands Tall, a community of women who learn from and inspire each other. Visit melnickmelnick.com and shestandstallmke.com for more information and to learn about future events. This week's conversation between Amelia and Christine covers reflections on generational relationships, tapping into intuition, pushing against expectations, how childhood informs our growth in middle life and changing the dynamic for future generations. A huge thank you to this season's featured musician, Gina Barrington. Remember to hit subscribe so you can be the first to know about new episodes and visit our website to join the Interwoven community, receive newsletters and event information, access all of our resources, and to connect with us on social. Find us at interwoven.com. That's I-N-T-E-R-W-O-V-X-N.com. Hey y'all, my name's Christine. I'm 38 and I live in Los Angeles. I grew up in Wisconsin with my amazing cousin, Amelia. And after college, I moved to Chicago for 11 years. I'm an Aries sun, a Gemini moon, and a Cancer rising. So I have this gentle, kind, outward demeanor, but under the surface, I'm pretty fiery and I'm curious about all the things. So I'm always chasing my next experience, looking for my next adventure and diving head first into whatever excites me. Mm. And I'm just excited to chat with my cousin today and dive a little deeper into our journeys to health and wellness and how we're in our 30s learning how our upbringing might have shaped that a little bit more than we ever realized. So I'm happy to be here. Hey guys, my name is Amelia. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was born and bred. I am a mom of two girls. I have a 13-year-old daughter. She'll be turning 13 tomorrow and a one and a half year old daughter as well. So my life is a little cuckoo crazy. I am the owner of my business, Her Health and Healing. I am a Scorpio. I am a Virgo rising and an Aquarius moon, which Christine can tell me more about. So Christine, what does this mean about me? It means that you have a lot of depth, Amelia. You've craved systems. So your sun sign is kind of your ego or your outward identity, big picture. So that's your Scorpio. And Scorpio sometimes gets a bad rap, but Scorpios just have a lot of depth to them. And they're very aware of energy and who they let into their lives and how they navigate certain situations. There's just a lot of complexity with Scorpio in a good way. You know, you've got the system for the Virgo, you're creating these beautiful programs that support women. And then you've got the Aquarius, you're, you're trying to up level, you're trying to bring people together. And then, you know, the Scorpio, you recognize that there's a lot of things going on underneath the surface that you don't want to shy away from, but you want to provide containers for people to express themselves. Wow. Well said. You know, as a Scorpio growing up, everyone would say like, oh, Scorpio, she's scary, <laughs> moody. And maybe that is somewhat true. But on the outside, I feel like I'm a pretty caring, approachable person. I guess it depends on who approaches me and if that is true or not. Yeah, that's a typical Scorpio response. I am into the idea that Scorpios are sexy. So I'll take that and wear that. I'll wear that badge of honor. There you go. You know, let's talk a little bit about our upbringing and the way we were raised in Milwaukee and just like our experience growing up. Christine and I grew up together oftentimes. So we grew up on the south side of Milwaukee in Bayview, which is now a really trendy, cool, popular place to live. But back in the day, you know, 30 plus years ago, it was a blue collar town. It still is, but it's got lots of cool attached to it now. I would say low, middle class, but lots of lower middle class as well. Yeah, we grew up in this beautiful house on the corner. Our grandpa would call it the king of the block 
because it is this beautiful yellow duplex on a large hill. So you can't miss this house if you're in the neighborhood that we grew up in. In the house, my grandparents, our grandparents lived on the lower level. On the top level, our uncle lived there. And my mom and I also lived in this house. So depending on the season of our life, we either lived on the upper or lower level. Christine's mom is my mom's sister. And so they lived down the street or part of her life and then moved further south. We would spend tons of time together growing up in this house in this crazy family and spend the summers together after school. I'm smiling because I'm just seeing the house and so many things are coming to mind and I lived in that house as well. I lived on the first floor in the back room for a little bit and I always say it was one of the happiest times of my life. I just remember you know it was always a happy place to be in that house and I loved being there. Each summer kind of was unique. It was you and me and your sister and my sister. And we were always doing something, (laughs) lemonade stands or listening to the Backstreet Boys or playing Nintendo Mm -hmm. um, or watching movies with our grandma or playing cards. And I think for me growing up in the Midwest, I did move further south with my family and it was a little bit more small town country. I always knew that I wanted to break free a little bit. For a while, I resented where I lived, but it's just because I had to break free. And now when I go back, I just love it so much. And it's such an important part of who I am and our upbringing. Oh, yeah. can relate to that with wanting to break free. I just like want to really paint a picture for people of what this like dynamic was like in this house. So we had our grandparents, our uncle, all the kids, my mom. And then we also had, um, we are very Eastern European. So So we also had tons of family members, aunts, uncles, great aunts and uncles, cousins, second, third, fourth cousins in the Bayview area or south side of Milwaukee that would frequently also be in this house coming in and out. So for dinner, for visits. So there were constant people coming in and out of this home. There was a lot of love, lots of love, but there was also some kind of funky dynamics going on too, right? Interesting characters, lots of drinking, lots of caregiving from the woman while the men did their own thing. Would you say that's accurate? It was a little bit of both. Grandpa would really be a caregiver, but at night he and his brothers would switch into drinking mode. Yeah, there was definitely a point where they would check out. So it was a beautiful place to be a part of, a great community. But like I said, they're Eastern European and they very much were traditional in the way of the women cooked the meals and the men were like the head of the household. When I think about it, there was always someone coming, knocking on the door. There were very little boundaries in terms of time and space. And Mm -hmm. I think even to this day, there's that element of, oh, Let's just pop over to to grandma and grandpa's and see who's there. It can be really beautiful, but we now know, you know, in a way that's not super healthy and supportive. Even people calling, I can literally see our grandma (laughs) being on the phone when certain people would call. Sometimes it was checking in. Sometimes it was asking for money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, it was asking for more. And, you know, it just always seemed that something was circulating in the house. A therapist of mine recently said that my, I shared this with Christine off air, but that my nervous system steady state is chaos. I think what I just explained really speaks to that because this was what I saw in my day to day. I lived in this house until I was 12 years old. I was constantly around people coming in and out. There is definitely a lack of boundaries. So there are still people calling and asking my grandpa for money and people showing up on our grandparents' porch asking for something and they will always give it. But I think this is an important stage to set for the way that Christine and I developed. So this was our haven, our sacred space, but also what was modeled to us, right? I lived in this house until I was 12 years old. But Christine, you you would go home and then what was your family like? Your like nuclear family like? My nuclear family was completely the opposite in the sense that we were super closed off and very private. My dad and I have had an interesting relationship over the years and we're in a really good place now, but you know, he wasn't the most nurturing 
father and my mom, same thing. I have a great relationship with my mom, but she was very devoted to her husband and really, as you said earlier, took on that primary role of cooking and cleaning and laundry. And there was that point where my dad, you know, would pour a drink and that was it. I think drinking is definitely something that has, I've seen how that's impacted my life now in my thirties. My sister, And I, same thing, we have a complicated relationship and I think we're in an okay place right now, but there was a little bit of chaos with her. And I think it was, it was just an interesting dynamic because you love your family. I love my nuclear family. And then I would love y'all and at grandma and grandpa's. And it's interesting because sometimes I still have to balance those energies to this day. I think sometimes there's an element of jealousy from some parts of my nuclear family, but it doesn't mean I love them any less. It's just a little bit different. I think what Christine is referring to is that our moms are sisters, but they are as different as different can get. My mom is a very free spirit, hippie, woo-woo, uh, not always the most responsible. I love you, mom. But very giving, very loving, very outspoken. And Christine's mom is also very outspoken, but more traditional in a lot of ways. She goes to her nine to five. She's done really well in her career. They have different political beliefs, different ways that they show up in their community and different ways that they show up in our family for sure. They're about 10 years apart so there's lots of budding heads and I think honestly I think this relationship for them started when they were kids because interestingly enough our grandma had mental health issues her entire life and Christine's mom really took the brunt of taking care of our grandma at a young age and my mom was the baby so she just kind of rode the wave right she didn't know what was going on so I think that resentment kind of started there and then my mom got pregnant when she was 18 And I think that dynamic really solidified right then and there that my mom was maybe not the most responsible person. And my Aunt Karen, Christine's mom, always felt like she kind of needed to like tell Terry, my mom, what to do and how to live her life and kind of guide her for better and for worse, because there are aspects about your mom that are really lovely in in the way that she shows up in terms of like her responsibilities and how she takes care of things. And there are really beautiful aspects about my mom, about she really just free flows and but they just have had a hard time meeting in the middle until the last I would say like last couple years they really are starting to see each other and they're in their mid 50s and early 60s so it's taken a whole lifetime to get here yeah I'm like tearing up just thinking about thinking about all that and I don't know if I ever shared this but I think I think my mom being the oldest grandma and grandpa were like hey you got to go out and get a job as soon as you can. And my mom did that. And then I think obviously it's your first child and you're a mom. So maybe you can speak about this. You know, there's that precedent that sat. I think my mom maybe just felt, I don't know, something that your mom just took a different path, which I think is what you're saying. Maybe she just something expectations, right? From the family. She was the baby. She kind of rode the wave. Your mom had to like step up to the plate. For sure. You know, I love our moms so much for who they are. And I always say I I would not be who I am without both of them. Your mom always encouraged me to dream big and to be a free spirit. And my mom taught me, you know, what it does mean to work for the same company for 40 years, go to that job every day, which hasn't been my path at all. But they both have such beautiful elements. And it's been really cool to see them sort of heal their relationship. And now my mom says, oh, I talked to Terry today. And I'm like, I'm still like, what? You talked to your sister? I'll just say another layer that's interesting from this is that my relationship with my sister isn't great. And my mom's always like, you and your sister just need to get along. And I'm like, well, you and your sister just need to get along. You know, that's what was modeled to you. Right? That's interesting. So I am the oldest of four. My sister is right below me. And then I have two brothers. So I'm the oldest, 34 years old. And then I have a sister who's 29. And then I have a younger brother who is in his early 20s and a brother who is 13. So there you have it. However, my relationship with my siblings is awfully close. I think that's because my mom 
literally beat me over the head with the concept that you must be close with your siblings. And Mm -hmm. there you go. I wonder why, because she wasn't close with her older sister. I think she sees how important that is. And there's been a lot of tension over the years with our, uh, with our mothers, but there's just been some really healing moments. And you know what? A lot of it always comes down to is misunderstanding of their experience. You know, there were a lot of things my mom learned about your mom with being a, having to be a caregiver for grandma at such a young age that she didn't know about. And so it really set the stage early. And then, you know, my mom being more vulnerable and being more direct with your mom, I think has really helped their relationship too. Man, that's, it's been a really interesting experience to witness. I think our family carries a lot of judgment outside of the immediate circle. And for whatever reason, your mom has always been a topic of discussion. It comes back to the boundaries. Like our family just family should be like your your diehard support system, right? They love you no matter what. And for whatever reason, there's been these dynamics in our family where people tend to judge rather than be curious. But I think what's happening now with my mom and your mom is that there is more of that curiosity, especially with your mom being a caregiver. And I don't think she gets enough credit for that at all because it's, it's emotionally and physically, it it entails a lot. It's great to see them coming together and recognizing what each other does. And we'll be right back. Rebecca here. Today's episode highlights Rooted MKE, a Milwaukee-based woman-owned business. Rooted MKE is a BIPOC children's bookstore and literacy exploration space. Through their mission of amplifying BIPOC stories and narratives, Rooted MKE specializes in the curation of book titles, academic support, author events, and family-centered experiences that unite and empower our community. Visit their storefront location at 5312 West Valit Street or shop online at rootedmke.com. Connect with their literary community on Facebook at rootedmke or on Instagram at rooted.mke. Interested in having your business featured on the Interwoven podcast? Contact us at hello at interwoven.com. Yeah, so let's dive into that a little bit more. So um, my mom, my nuclear family has always been like the black sheep of our extended family. In our family, we have two sets of sisters. Our set of sisters married a set of brothers. So our grandma and grandpa married our great aunt and uncle who were also siblings. So in our family, we have cousins that are also like siblings because they have the same DNA. So this has created a lot of interesting relationships, a lot of blurry boundaries. So let me just pull the thread a little bit more on our family tree, if you will. It's It takes a minute to understand. I tried to explain this to my boyfriend's son recently and his eyes got so big while he was trying to understand it. So essentially, we have two brothers that married two sisters. Our grandma's sister married our grandpa's brother. And then what's kind of interesting is from each of those marriages came three children. On each side, first there was a daughter. So that would be my mom, Karen. And then on the other side, there was a daughter named Nancy. From our grandparents, then there was a son, That's our Uncle Peter, who we've talked about briefly. On the other side, there was our Uncle Tom. No, Christine, he's not our uncle. He's he's our cousin, but we always called him uncle. And then back to our grandparents, Amelia's mom, Terry. And then on the other side of grandparents was the youngest daughter, Sharon. And then from there, it just keeps going. My mom had me and my sister. Amelia's mom had Amelia, Emily, and then the two boys. And then on the other side, the first daughter, Nancy, she had two girls. And then Sharon, the youngest daughter, she had some children. And it just keeps going. It just keeps going. (laughs) What's really beautiful is I think back to like these big family parties where it was just tons of people and so much love. But to Amelia's point, you know, that's where some of the boundaries started to get blurred. And, you know, every family has drama. Again, family should be a place where you come and belong. And I think that that's something that I've always just craved so much in my life, like belonging. Unfortunately, I've experienced a lot of judgment in my family. That's been hard. So for me, I would say that one of the biggest steps to recognizing it was getting a little space from all of that. But I just want you all to understand just kind of like the expansiveness of our family all together and like eating and drinking and probably drinking more than we should. And it 
it can lead to different situations. And there are definitely black sheep in our family. And my mom was one of those people. And my nuclear family has always been a black sheep. That was pretty obvious. That's been obvious to me my whole life. So that's interesting too. My family, my sister and I, and my mom specifically, were always working towards being accepted in our family instead of just embraced as we are. I think that that dynamic really has led me to be in the business that I'm in. Not only the encouragement from my mom to explore alternative medicines and modalities and lean into the woo-woo side and mental health aspect, but also just not being embraced for who we we were and not being looked at as strong women. So let's like talk more about what we're doing now and how we think that our family dynamic has led us to this path. So many things are coming up for me. I think I said this earlier, there was always a part of me that knew I wanted to expand beyond Wisconsin and I started in Chicago. I was, you know, the first of our cousin group and there was a lot of pressure also person though in our family out of like 50 plus people who don't (laughs) leave the family okay so this isn't just like small (laughs) cousins like there's a few of us this is like tons of people who don't leave the family okay go ahead (laughs) thanks guys yeah so after after college i moved to chicago and it was it felt safe you know it was it was far from my family, but still close enough, which is something I said a lot. Yeah, I spent some time there, went through my Saturn returns, which was pretty disruptive in my life, and started teaching yoga. This was about seven and a half years ago, eight years ago, did my teacher training. It changed my life. Interestingly enough, this was a time when our family started to go through a really rough patch. We lost a lot of family members. I think we're still kind of figuring out our dynamics. You know, I went into yoga teaching teacher training, just totally vulnerable and ready to be transformed and really fell in love with the practice and learned that I love teaching yoga. And then what I didn't expect was this beautiful spiritual journey to unfold over the next seven years. And it would take me to remarkable places near and far and high and low. And I feel so blessed to have this journey around this time you started to go into your fitness journey and go through your spiritual journey. And so it's been really great to go through this alongside of you. And I remember when I first started teaching yoga, even in our family, people looked at me funny and (laughs) they were like, don't, what is yoga? You know, can you touch your toes? If you can't touch your toes, you can't be a yoga teacher. You know, right from the get-go, this misunderstanding of what yoga is and what it's all about. I'll just say I really had to tap into my intuition there and trust that I was going on this path that was true to me. Our family was up in arms about it. One, because you left a stable career. People have a very hard time understanding that. I think that's normal for society as a whole. Also, it was very much a modeling of my mom, right? Like my mom had encouraged you to take your spiritual path. My mom, the black sheep, that was very much something she would do. And that is not looked at from our family perspective as someone who was going to be successful. It was very misunderstood. Just a quick point of clarity, I actually lost my job. And that was part of my Saturn returns. But it was such a beautiful opportunity to lean in. But yeah, exactly. Everyone was like, Oh, I'm so sorry, you lost your job. And you know, what are you going to do? And it's it was like the world was crumbling. And I was like, I'm going to teach yoga, it's gonna be fine. And you know, people were freaking out. The thing was, in my job, I was so miserable. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, working in like marketing and sales. And I had drifted so far from my truth. And I was like, this can't be it for life. (laughs) This just can't be it. Little did I know the universe already had some course correction in motion. We haven't even talked about health that much in our family and what that means. I feel so encouraged about my life and the outlook that's ahead of me now than I ever did when I was grinding away at a nine to five corporate job. You and I started at the same time in the health and wellness business, but I, there were no expectations of me. Not only was my mom, my mom, the black sheep, but also I ended up having a child young. So I ended up having my first daughter when I was 21. It was not planned. And I think from our family 
Emily's perspective, I was going down the same path as my mom. I did graduate from college, but I didn't have a clear idea of exactly what I wanted to do when I was, you know, 21. Who does? Interesting side note, my mom and I ended up having children at the same time. So that just adds to the family cuckoo craziness. So I started in the health and wellness field as somebody who was just curious about moving their body. And I liked taking fitness classes at a local bar studio that I was a member at. And I thought, oh, I could do this. This is a great way for me to have a free membership and get out of the house a little bit and still support my family. So I was a single mom at the time. My daughter was probably about five, taught multiple classes a week. And my career really unfolded from that point forward. But I just, you know, it's interesting you talking and thinking back to you moving into the health and wellness space and how everyone was so scared about what you were doing. And no one was really concerned about what I was doing. That's a lot of pressure to put on you. I just remember being inspired by you. You were doing a lot of things around that time. And you were doing some restaurant stuff and event planning. And I was like, I just remember seeing you and being like, Amelia's making some moves and she's going to go places. There are so many avenues to go. And I think what this world needs is people going off on their own and seeing what's possible. I think something that you and I have always related to with one another is that we are in search for our most authentic life. And that maybe wasn't so clear to us when we were younger. You know, I think you and I both have always been like, we're invested in finding and living and creating a a life that feels authentic and true to us. And that also might mean taking unconventional steps. Luckily, you and I have had each other to talk about that with because it's not always easy and there's not a clear path. I think what you and I both crave as well is is freedom in our life, right? And how we live in a nutty system and I don't want to go on my soapbox too much, but how kind of crazy is it that we immediately put ourselves in debt as young people so that we can get a job and that job doesn't even pay us what we need to live. And then we hustle, then we buy things. So we have to keep working. And it, it's just this cycle and this pattern. And I think freedom is something that you and I both crave. I think what was modeled to us as women, especially was like, you have a role, be small, play the role, don't ask questions. Take care of your family. That's that. Put your own well-being at the bottom of the list. It's just interesting hearing you talk about the money component. Even starting as a yoga teacher, you know, people are like, are you going to make money? And we live in a material world. So obviously money is something we need, but it's been cool to see you make money and then step into that that role of businesswoman. I think that, again, moving to California, I've seen how much opportunity there is for that. When I started teaching yoga, I had also gone through a breakup and I was living on my own in Chicago, back in a studio after 10 years of living there. And I remember when I moved into that studio with my dog, Riley, I was like, I'm not going to be here long. I just already knew. I knew I wanted to live somewhere warm, but I had never considered California. And I'll tell you why. It's because growing up, my dad... And my mom would always say, don't move to California. There's crazy liberals and it's going to fall into the ocean. And I literally believe that my politics are not aligned with my parents. I'm really glad that something called me to California. There was definitely a powerful force. I had never even been to California. So anyways, fast forward six months, things really fell into place and I was moving to California. People are like, it's so expensive in our family. They're just like, it's so expensive. How are you going to live? How are you going to take care of your dog? All the objections immediately right in my face. My mom was not happy about it. She's like, I'm never going to see you again. And my mom was pushing you to go, right? (laughs) Yeah. My mom was like, okay, well you have to tell your father. And I was like, okay. I'm like, dad, I have to tell you something. I'm moving to California. And he was just like, okay, cool. Go for it. It's your life. And I think maybe that was the beginning of my healing journey with my dad. I moved to California and that's when you really started to lead into breath work Mm. and your business. I left my bar studio job many years ago now, but I really leaned into, you know, the feels of wanting to help empower women and help women feel seen and show women what health looks like. After you and I have have really gone into layers of this over the years, it's really obvious to me that the reason I want to help women is because the women in our family haven't been seen, because my mom hasn't been seen, because your mom in her ways hasn't been seen. Empowerment really starts by being seen and feeling in your body and feeling like what you do and what you say matters 
years and doing the inner work and doing the physical work. My work now really focuses on helping women feel seen and feeling good and feeling empowered. And I do that through movement. So teaching Pilates and intuitive movement through breath work, through doing and leading and facilitating breath work sessions and doing some inner healing, empowerment coaching, and just really encompassing all the mental, spiritual, physical benefits, encompassing, you know, mental, spiritual, physical, emotional wellness for women to help people like our moms and to help keep moving the dial forward for people like us. We're the first people in our family who've really broken the mold. I think that's what's bonded us so much. We've always been close, but man, our our paths have have really have really grown together. We're changing the dynamic and the history of for the rest of our family and for the you know our children's potential and it's just really powerful stuff. I think there's this divine calling within me and I don't think the universe would have given us all the experiences we have if it wasn't to help people along their journey and I just really want to help people break free and know that there is something more in each and every one of us. And it's so scary to leap. It's so scary to break the pattern. The thing is, once you start, the work doesn't stop. Being able to hold space for people is definitely half of the battle. And then just continuing to support them along that journey. Because one thing that I always think about is, you know, what do you want out of this life? As women growing up, we weren't always asked that. Now it's been interesting as I've been on this journey to just stand in my truth more and say, this is what I want for my life. So Christine, what is essential for you? For me, what's essential every day is moving my body, drinking water, eating nutritious food, getting plenty of sleep, doing something that contributes to my long-term goal, and then being in nature. That could be a walk around the block. It could be time with an animal, something unconditioned by our world, or getting out on a hike, going in the mountains. And lastly, connection, an authentic conversation with someone each and every day, someone I love, maybe someone I see at the grocery store, just a conversation that goes beyond the virtual space. Because what about you? What is essential to you? Definitely same. All the things you said, the just basic necessities, water, sleep, nutrition, walking, moving my body, all super important for me. And I will add checking in and caring for my mental health, making sure that I am going to therapy to encourage dopamine hits through movement, through nature, through sunlight, checking in with my patterns and the way that I show up for myself and my family, for my clients, for my community, taking my medication for depression and anxiety. It's definitely important. Just having space and time and for downtime and connection with my family and, you know, trying to be as mindful as I can in the moments that we have. That's super important to me as well. It's beautiful. I'm so grateful for you because I'm just excited to see where you go. I think I said that before. Christine, I love you so much. You are such a ray of sunshine. I will talk with you soon. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to give us a star review and to hit subscribe for a new empowering conversation each week. Visit our website where you'll find our newsletter, event dates, and other amazing resources. Visit interwoven.com, that's I-N-T-E-R-W-O-V-X-N.com to sign up today. This show's copyright is summer of 2023. We want to thank Melnick and Melnick for their support this season. Our interwoven producers are Teresa Kopak, Rebecca Jankowski, and Jen Gilmore. All original music was created and performed by Gina Barrington.